Before the Second World War, Germany had been a world leader in rocket development, pioneering revolutionary new technologies like liquid fuel in the 1930s. These developments were used to conduct covert military research into the application of rockets on aircraft and as weapons of war. While there were around a dozen concepts conceived and a handful of prototypes built during the war, only one rocket-powered plane made its way onto the battlefield, the ME-163 Comet Interceptor. Nearly 96 years ago, Dr. Alexander Lippisch, a distinguished aeronautical engineer, made the first serious attempt at manned rocket-powered flight with a modified glider. On June 11, 1928, his creation, the Onter, or Duck in German, soared into the skies, propelled by two gunpowder-fueled rockets as part of the Opel Rack program. While the first flight was a success, the Onter would unfortunately burn beyond repair during its second flight. Now, undeterred by the setback, Lippisch proceeded to construct the Opel Rack 1, the world's first purpose built rocket plane. On September 30, 1929, the Opel Rack 1 took its first public flight in front of a crowd of spectators. Piloted by Fritz von Opel, the project's namesake, the flight covered nearly 3.5 kilometers, or one mile, at a speed of around 150 kilometers per hour, or 93 miles per hour, before making a hard landing. These early experiments were foundational for advances in rocket flight across the globe, and it became known as the Rocket Rumble. The worldwide reverberations of this rumble prompted the German Air Ministry to commission pioneering rocket designer Helmuth Volta and his company to design and build a rocket for military aircraft in 1936. This engine would power the Heinkel HE-176, the world's first liquid-fueled rocket aircraft, but it was designed only for speed. The Air Ministry was interested in a weapon system, and a new airframe design was needed. Dr. Lippisch caught wind of this secret project, and using his experience building rocket craft and his position in the German Gliding Research Institute, or DSF, he quickly became the leader of what was called Project X. His initial prototypes were originally based on a tailless flying wing design, but Lippisch backed into a more conventional design after discovering potential vertical stability issues at high and low speeds. The flammability of the caustic liquid rocket fuels powering the plane also made the shift to an all-metal design a costly necessity as well. His final prototype would be designated DFS-194 and was subject to a barrage of unpowered stress tests as a glider. The DFS-194 measured 6.4 meters in length, that's about 21 feet, with a wingspan of 10.5 meters, or about 34 feet, and it was powered by a newly designed Volta R1203 rocket engine. At launch, the plane weighed about 2 tons and could climb at an impressive rate of 1,615 feet a minute, or about 5,300 feet a minute. It could easily reach speeds of 550 kilometers an hour or 343 miles per hour in level flight. During a dive, a test pilot achieved a speed of 850 kilometers an hour or 528 miles per hour, setting a world speed record which was kept secret until after VE Day in 1945. The prototype fighter demonstrated impressive durability, surviving repeated acceleration forces of at least 11 Gs. Just before we continue with today's episode, let me talk about something that we might not give the attention that it deserves, and that's skincare. And that's where today's sponsor, Tiege Hanley, comes in. Look, I'm no skincare expert, but even guys like me, we, you know, need some help with our skin to keep it young and fresh looking, and Tiege Hanley makes it easy with their straightforward skincare routine. They've got the level one system, perfect to get started, it includes a daily face wash, an exfoliating scrub for twice a week, an AM moisturizer with SPF 50 because sun protection is important, stops you getting all old and wrinkly, and a PM moisturizer to keep your skin hydrated throughout the night. Each box comes with a handy instruction card, sort of a skincare cheat sheet. It tells you when to use each product and how much to put on. T. Shanley also has over 7,000 five-star reviews on their website from satisfied customers worldwide. Plus, members enjoy perks like at least 20% off retail prices, the ability to customize their box monthly deals, and free US shipping. And because they're sponsoring this video, they've got a deal for you. Click the link below, you'll get 30% off your first box, plus a free gift. You can choose either a premium silicone body scrubber or a nail and face grooming kit. All you have to do, click the link below to get started, and now back to today's video. Following Adolf Hitler and the Nazi Party's consolidation of power in 1938, Project X underwent reorganization, finally transitioning to Messerschmitt in January 1939 at Lippisch's request. Messerschmitt sought to conceal the military nature of the project, the new designation of ME-163A being adopted. Despite many accomplishments, the Nazis' recent expansion into Poland forced the redirection of funds and material from experimental weapon systems in order to support the Eastern Front. Hitler's confidence in Blitzkrieg tactics to secure victory in the war led to the construction of only 13 ME-163A units. These planes would be mainly used for training purposes. 
Even with the lack of funding, Messerschmitt's design teams initiated work on an upgraded rocket plane. The ME-163B was optimized for mass production, paving the way for an order of 66 in March of 1942. The design and construction of this new variant took five months. And then with production in full swing, the JG-400 Operational Group was founded, and they would specialize in the use of these unique point defense fighters for the rest of the war. Because of the massive jets of flame that shot from the rear of the craft had left long tails of dense smoke in flight, the production model was dubbed the Comet. The Comet encountered several notable challenges in design and use. Its specialized cowl, constructed to shield the pilot from the explosive chemical reaction powering the plane, resulted in a total lack of rear visibility. Allied pilots would often describe the movements of the Comets as if their pilots were trying to see behind them. Despite collaborative efforts between designers and numerous pilots to enhance visibility in the new model, these design attempts proved unsuccessful. The ME-163B's cowl and nose cone left pilots with less visibility than earlier prototypes, particularly during landing. Changes in the chemical agents used to power the engine and the possibility of vacuums forming in the fuel system because of the newly powered fuel pumps meant that the Comet pilots now found themselves essentially seated inside a bomb rather reminiscent of the V-2 rocket. This was made all the more nerve-wracking given the unpredictable nature of the metal fuel lines used in the engine system. Despite being the best choice at the time, these lines and their couplings would often spring invisible leaks which could start fires or explode both on the tarmac and in the air. Several such fires claimed the lives of several pilots and ground crew. To help counter some of this risk, Comet pilots were kept on a strict, low-fiber diet to keep them from introducing their own flammable gases into the mix. The ME-163B marked the introduction of weaponry to the Comet in the form of powerful 30mm cannons. However, the Comet's exceptional speed proved to be a double-edged sword. Pilots encountered significant challenges in accurately aiming conventional weapons. They were just so much faster than their targets, giving pilots mere moments to line up and take shots before passing enemy planes. By July 1942, comets were being used in attempts to intercept Allied spy planes. It was during these operations that the plane's true usefulness was shown to be intercepting bomber formations. By the end of July, only four of the 16 combat-ready comets were operational due to water shortages, which were used to flush the fuel systems after each flight to prevent explosions during refueling kind of important. While proving unsuccessful in air combat, the plane was making an impression on Allied pilots with its sheer speed. It wasn't until late 1944 that the Comet began seeing combat success. In August, Comet pilots successfully shot down five B-17 bombers in two combat missions. This success came at a loss, though. One of the Allies supporting B-51 Mustangs was able to shoot down a Comet despite its superior speed. To address the Comet's difficulty in hitting its targets, an experimental rocket system known as SG-500 Jagafast was implemented. Somewhat similar to the hunting strategy of Pacific barrel eye fish, an array of rockets faced upward through the comet's wing. These rockets were triggered by an optical sensor capable of detecting the shadows of enemy aircraft above. These rocket cannons operated like a recallless rifle, using the force of the shot to eject the rocket's tube through the bottom of the wing, negating any effect firing the weapon had on the plane's momentum. Despite such promising innovation, the Jagafast was only installed on two comets, and the weapon would only be used in combat a single time, successfully downing a Lancaster bomber in April 1945. The ME-163B also had some serious advantages. Alongside its blistering speed, the comet's slope design and lack of external armaments or storage tanks made it incredibly stealthy for the time. It would barely show up on radar screens and moved far too quickly to be recognized as a plane. The paint scheme chosen for the Comet had stealth in mind as well, mottled green and brown for the top and powdery periwinkle blue for the bottom. This made it virtually invisible to pilots or gunners looking up or down on the Comet. Due to its unconventional landing gear, the Comet relied on a specialized retrievable vehicle, the Schlusschlepper, a vehicle one might describe as rather cute, were it not a key part of a Nazi weapons platform. Originally used by farmers as a cheap and sturdy replacement for a typical four-wheeled tractor to pull tillers and harvesting equipment, several of these two-wheeled walking tractors were specifically modified by the Luftwaffe for hauling Comets. These vehicles could be easily customized to pull and power various trailers, making them ideal for experimental aircraft work. Several specialized Schuschlepper designs were implemented. These included a simple fork-shaped hydraulic lift to prop comets onto their single rear wheel for rolling, a pair of sausage-shaped airbags that would be inflated to lift the plane from the ground, and the most common of which used hydraulic arms to lift the plane by its wings onto a thin track trailer where it rested upon its landing skid. Bannings were hard 
and fast. And frequent malfunctions in the comet's landing skids led to many of the pilots being injured or dying upon an impact. On occasion, these hard landings ignited the remaining rocket fuel left in the plane's engines, causing large explosions. This was compounded by the lack of sight and control in the late stages of landing. The comet's control surfaces would only respond with about 128 km an hour or 80 miles per hour of airspeed, as they couldn't rely on propeller backwash for maneuvering. These issues were never thoroughly addressed as the war progressed. New fronts and heavy resistance from the Allies drew even more resources away from less traditional weapons programs. In 1944, Messerschmitt licensed their Comet design to the Imperial Japanese Army Air Service. Mitsubishi designated their version of the Comet Mitsubishi J-8M Shusi. Issues with shipping a Comet to Japan as a practical example meant that Japanese aircraft designers had to reverse engineer their design from flight operation manuals and whatever other documentation their German counterparts managed to send them. The engine license alone would cost the Japanese Empire 20 million Reichmarks, or 93 million euros, or 101 million dollars in 2024 money. The first J-8Ms would roll off the assembly lines in March of 1945. Seven were produced in total. The J-8M would take its first powered flight on the 7th of July 1945. This test proved fatal for the pilot after the engine stalled, forcing an emergency landing. Because of the craft's poor visibility and other landing difficulties, the pilot struck a building near the airfield and his plane burst into flames. Because of these difficulties, the nuclear bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and Hirohito's subsequent unconditional surrender, the Japanese comet program came to an official end on August 15, 1945. The Germans had major issues hitting targets with their comet's conventional weapons, but one could imagine how the warped Bushido ideals of the Imperial Japanese military could have found an effective use for the superfast and highly explosive plane. Kamikaze fighters were an all-too-common threat to American forces in the Pacific theater. Had the Nazis successfully delivered prototypes of the comet or design specifications to Japan earlier in the war, history could have played out rather differently. In the latter stages of the war, the Comet faced competition from Heinkel's HE-162A Spatz jet fighter, pressed into service under the emergency fighter program. The jet interceptor boasted a 30-minute combat time compared to the Comet's seven and a half minutes of powered flight. Additionally, it could effectively hit its target without requiring specialized flight training or weaponry. In response, Messerschmitt initiated the development of an improved ME-163C, focusing on fuel capacity, engine efficiency, and cost reduction. Due to the destruction of records and poor record keeping associated with the war's end, precise production numbers for the C variant of the comet are unavailable. However, at least three prototypes were completed and flight tested to varying degrees in 1945. This model was never photographed or tested with its designated engine, leaving its capabilities shrouded in speculation. A single ME-163D was constructed and developed in parallel with the C variant. Messerschmitt were unable to keep up with their experimental planes due to expanded emergency production of other conventional models. Because of this, the project was handed over to Junkers Aircraft and Motor Works. The aircraft designers at Junkers took to modifying several existing comets to extend their fuselages before the prototype D variant was produced. A notable change was the pressurization of the cockpit, substantially increasing the plane's operational ceiling. This craft was handed back to Messerschmitt in late 1944 and redesignated ME-263. Although Messerschmitt produced two more prototypes, they never flew under their own power due to fuel shortages intensifying with the advances of the Allies and the Russians. These comets were designed with the shortcomings of the B variant in mind. One notable change was the absence of a rear cowl, providing the pilot with a clear view behind them. The cockpit resembled that of modern fighters, featuring a sleek dome with easy entry and visibility as primary design factors. Another significant modification was the addition of a smaller flight rocket, complementing the main launch rocket and enabling longer flight times at lower speeds. The Allied advance into Germany accelerated rapidly in May 1945. Consequently, many of the airfields where comets were stationed were captured. Despite standing orders for German pilots and air crews to destroy their aircraft to prevent them from falling into enemy hands, dozens of comets were surrendered to the Allies. One of the most significant handovers occurred on May the 8th, when the GJ-400 surrendered all of its operational rocket planes to the Allies under British command. At least 24 of these unique planes were promptly shipped across the Channel for thorough examination and reverse engineering in England. Post-war Britain would generously provide the French Air Force with four captured comets. The Crown also bestowed one plane each to Australia and Canada. American and Soviet forces seized unknown numbers of operational comets and even more incomplete airframes, transporting them back to their lines for further study. 
Among the spoils of war was Dr. Alexander Lippisch himself. As part of Operation Paperclip, the renowned aircraft designer, along with his designs and notes, were transported to Ohio. Exotic captured aircraft, including the Arado 234 and the HE 162, along with the Comet, took flight from Wright Field in Ohio, aiming to unravel the workings of these advanced machines. Due to privacy concerns at Wright Field, the HE 162 and Comet projects were relocated to Murak Army Airfield in California. The insights gained from these tests played a pivotal role in the development of the Bell X 1, which broke the sound barrier on October 14, 1947, ushering in a new era of flight. These unique interceptors may have exhibited record breaking speed, but the Comet proved to be a combat failure. The concept was the first of its kind, but its implementation was clumsy, hampered by wartime pressures and the sheer danger of rocket fuels, especially before advances in material science. In spite of widespread research and use, these fighters only downed a few targets during combat operations and faced extended downtime after a single flight due to various shortages. In the end, the comet proved little more than a shock and awe showpiece given the inherent dangers of early rocket flight. Just before you go today, don't forget to check out Tiege Hanley by clicking the link in the description for that exclusive deal, and I'll see you in the next video.